You're listening to a podcast from the world. Coming and welcome to the second part of the evening. And um, the author of uh, Tomorrow's Here Today: Lightning Seeds, Football, and Cosmic Post Punk. Um, whatever that is, is. Uh, whatever that means, is uh, a record producer and a songwriter, and uh, the man behind a series of absolutely fantastic, softly psychedelic left field pop tunes. Uh, but he's also uh, the co-author of the new national anthem. And this has been both a blessing and a curse, as he will testify. Please welcome Ian Brody. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much. So, Ian, well, firstly, just writing a book I mean, you, with, with um, John Higgs, in fact, who we were talking to Absolutely. Uh, earlier on. Absolutely. It was on. brilliant a moment ago. Yeah. yeah. And so what was that like? How did that feel, trying to make sense of everything after all this time? Uh, it's, it's tricky, actually, because you, uh, you remember... I, originally, I wanted it to be a book of anecdotes, not so much a biography. Um, I kind of just wanted... Because I found myself... Because I'm old, and uh, <laughs> it was so strange in the late 70s and stuff, and, you know, the stuff that went on felt a bit like a lost world. And I'd often be recounting stories to people, and they'd say, you know, you should, you should write this down because the world's changed and no one will remember. And that's something that really re- resonates with me. I think my songs are like that, you know, that I just worried about things disappearing. Uh, so I thought it'd be good to do a book of anecdotes. And John was so great at it that it developed into half that and half a biography, really. He was... Uh, you know, it, it was he allowed me to kind of expound, you know, in a way, very relaxing way, and, and sort of uh, make sense of it with me. Uh, you know, after we chat about it, it made more sense to me than it had before. Well, it, it's a fantastic book, and it opens with your just growing up in Liverpool, really. And I was interested by the fact that. Uh, the Beatles don't get much of a mention. And I thought that's... Well, I mean, you would have been, I don't know, what, about 11 or 12, I suppose, when they split up. And it may have been that they didn't have much impact on you or that whole first music boom of, of Liverpool didn't have much impact. Or it may have been that you were driving towards, which you very successfully did with various others, establishing a whole new Liverpool thing in the late 70s. So what, 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 what did the Beatles... You know, was that something you were involved in when you were growing up? I love the Beatles, you know, and I was growing up in the 60s, Liverpool, and although the Beatles kind of moved to London, at that time, everyone was very proud of the Beatles, and it was very kind of potent in the whole, you know, I grew up on a, in a, a house in a place called Menlove Gardens, which is off Menlove Avenue, so Quarry Bank was my local school, and Dovedale, and all the places John went, really, and um, so it was, and it was, at the time, growing up, you know, there was Radio Caroline, but before that there was, there was the Beatles and the films were coming out. And for my birthday, my brother would take me to the films. And uh, the first gig I ever went to was the Beatles. So that was the first... Age what? Uh, well, the story, it's not quite as good as it sounds, to be <laughs> fair. <laughs> I well, wish, you just carry you know, on if you want, yeah, now, ignore yeah. that. No, of so my dad had this mate, and the Beatles were playing, and he could get these tickets, you know, and he got these tickets, and he got three tickets. And he said, my two elder brothers, and he said, you can go, and I've got you these tickets, but you've got to take Ian. Because I was, even then, obsessed with music, you know. And they were really cheesed off about that, you know. They really didn't want me to go. But it was the only way they could get to go. So they kind of tagged me along. I was probably, you know, five or six, six or seven. Can you remember it? I, well, here's my memory of Here's what happened. So we went in, and it was all very exciting. I remember going in and someone giving me a poster for Ready, Steady, Go. Kathy McGowan, I had no idea who it was, but I took the poster, you know. I was really happy, and we kind of went in. And then the lights went on, and just all these girls started screaming at the top of the voice, you know. And it was terrifying for me, you know. I was absolutely terrified. I presume you couldn't see anything either. It sort of came on. I don't think they'd even come on stage yet. And it was just full pelt screams, you know. And I, I started crying, you know. And my brother said to me, turn the other way and put your fingers in your ear and you'll be okay. 
So I turned the other way and I put my fingers in my ear and then we went home <laughs> about an hour later. And that so was my Beatles experience. That was my seeing yeah. the Beatles live, you know. Yeah. It was not what you'd imagine. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. Can you remember the first record you bought? I can, actually, yeah. There used to be... Uh, I, I, well, I grew up with two elder brothers, so there was loads of records in the house. You know, my dad would have his Frank Sinatra records. Um, one brother, my eldest brother, would have kind of Dylan, Loving Spoonful, stuff like that. And then in my other brother's bedroom, it was more progressive, kind of Jefferson, st- Jefferson Airplane, as it would have been at the time. West Coasty stuff, smell of weed coming out all the time, you know. <laughs> And um, and so there were records around all the time. I used to sort of sneak in and play the records and stuff. And they both had guitars, which I wasn't allowed to play. Uh, and but the first time I remember for my birthday, I had some money, and I think it was 1969. And Brian Epstein had a shop, Nems, in town, but there was also one on Allerton Road by Penny Lane, uh, which was where, where I'm from. And um, I remember, you know, going down, I think with, with, with my mum, you know, and we kind of went down and we went in, and I bought, I thought, I, there was, I just looked at it and I thought, that looks good. And I bought Space Oddity by David Bowie. And uh, it's a really cool record to have started <laughs> that's with. A, that's a I'm really glad, way yeah, to start. you know. Usually it's the know. Wombles. Or I was going to say, fortunately, the Wombles weren't quite oh, out no, yet, no, yeah. No, or I think I would have been attracted to that cover yeah. a lot more, you know. I've just picked out two of the records that you mentioned in the book because you, you said they were both absolutely perfect records. One is uh, a C. Emily Play by the Pink Floyd, and the other is uh, Kraftwerk's Autobahn. I just picked those out because I just wondered why, why you felt so strongly about them. They are, must have been a fantastic record. I think they're two different memories that resonate quite strongly with me. So when I was younger, the way you kind of got to hear music, I, there was Radio Caroline, and I used to have a little white transistor radio with one of those earpieces that you really can't hear anything on at all, you know. And I used to kind of listen to Radio Caroline a lot and they'd play things like Days of Pearly Spencer and, you know, just kind of psychedelic-y, West Coasty things. And I loved it, really. Uh, and I remember hearing... It might even be a false memory, because I, I, sometimes I can't tell the difference between dreams and memories and what was real. But my memory is that I was lying. We'd played footy in this field outside the house, and then I was kind of, you know, just lying in, uh, down, and I had the little thing in on Radio Caroline and see Emily play came on. And even at that age, I just couldn't, it, it was like I, it, magic, you know? And it was like the other records, but then it'd go, diddle, diddle, you know, and it, and it was like a dream and like psychedelic and Sid Barrett, but the, it was like the perfect song. It was like experimental. I didn't understand part of it. I could sing it. I loved the voice, I wanted to meet the bloke, you know, it was just, it really, it was like a, a, well, lightning, not lightning seeds, but it was like a bolt of lightning to me, I just, it was the first, I'd love the Beatles, but this was like, I think this, and then Bowie, and Roxy, and mm. Bowl, and they were, you know, and it was just, it, it, uh, it was a massive effect on me, you know, and well, the craft, you can, see, you can see echoes of that in the music that you to write later on, actually. I think I'm but, always uh, trying to write. Um, yeah, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I, we're looking at a picture now of a, of a guy called Roger Eagle, uh, who's a, a big, uh, big figure in the book. There are various other big figures too who have a huge uh, effect on your on your life and career. But Roger Eagle um, started Eric's Record Club, didn't he? And uh, just describe. Didn't he have some system whereby? He used to loan you three albums a week or something? I don't know what it was. It was some sort of yeah, club. it wasn't a record club. It was just a club, to be honest, that had bands on. It was uh, a venue. Oh, no, Eric's no, I know. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I know that. And, yeah, I went um, with that, yeah. But it was... Um, so, you know, I, I was like a... You know, just... A, a, I was like a kid hanging around Matthew Street, and I'd... I'd you know, I'd played guitar in the, what John was talking about earlier, the Illuminatus. That was my first experience of, 
really, I think I might turn, but it was like I wandered into Matthew Street as a kid and I was carrying a guitar. Funny enough, I, whenever I see Craig Charles, he always says to me, I used to see you walking about Liverpool and you were always carrying a guitar. You know, why is that? And, and I, I think, yeah, why is that? I just used to take it out with me and that hope that John Lennon would be passing it's and say, oh, you've got a guitar. This is what I do for a living. Yeah, you know, or hope, hoping to. Yeah. And uh, I was about 15 and I wandered into Matthew Street, which was a deserted area at that time, just like cobbledy stones and empty warehouses. And there was one warehouse that wasn't empty. And it was where a guy called Peter O'Halligan had decided that Carl Gustav Jung and everything he'd written about in the ley lines, that all centered on Liverpool. And he'd, he'd written something like this, Gustav Jung, and, but he hadn't specified Matthew Street. But I think Peter had just decided it should be Matthew Street. That's where the cavern was. And I'm gonna say it is Matthew Street. And he opened a warehouse and he wrote on it, the Liverpool School of Music, Dream, Art and Pun, or Music, Dream and Pun, some variation of that. And I was kind of outside there in the rain with my guitar. And, um, you know, he was outside and he said, come in if you want, you know, and have a cup of tea and see what's going on. So I wandered in and they were just doing the alarm and the Illuminatus, Ken was there. And Bill was being the stage manager. And I think my memory is actually that I sort of went there and then Ken said to me, you've got a guitar, we need a guitar player in the play in one of the scenes. Do you want to be in the play? And I was like, yeah, great, you know. So then I was professional. <laughs> I, had a, you know, I had a job and I was going to be in this play. And I kind of remember Bill coming over and saying, can I have a go on your guitar, you know. And he couldn't play the guitar, you know, and, and he was very heavy handed and he sort of picked it up, hit it really hard and broke a string, said sorry, put it down and went off. You know, that was the first time I met Bill. And um, yeah, and from then on, then Matthew Street seemed to sort of come alive at that point. And Roger, who'd been a great northern soul DJ in Manchester and he'd had a place called The Twisted Wheel. Uh, who he famously, when the Stones did their first album and they were playing Manchester, they came down the twisted wheel and Roger played every track on their album by the original artist. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. That's brilliant. And they were like, whoa, no one's heard these records, yeah. you know. Um, Eric's was an incredible place. I, I remember going there and I just found an old bill here which we just put up on the screen. And uh, you just think in one week, this is 1977, they had the Clash supported by the Slits, they had the Jam, they had Wayne County, they had the Stranglers, the Heartbreakers, Albert Dock, whatever happened to them, I don't know, Ramones plus the Talking Heads, Generation X and the Damned. I mean, it's pretty fantastic, isn't it? it just yeah, no, for me it was like, incredible. you know, there's this little club and they let me in for nothing. Yeah. And Roger kind of, funnily enough, going back to the craft work thing, when I met Roger, you know, one of the first things he did, he had a flat in Egberth in Liverpool and uh, he shared it with the drummer out of Albert Dock, who then became Yachts, and, um, which was an old band from Liverpool. And uh, I kind of remember visiting him. He took me back, you know, we went back to the flat there and he sat me down and he gave me my first spliff, actually. And he gave me this big spliff and he put Kraftwerk Autobahn <laughs> on really loud. And he said, this will change your life, you know. <laughs> And it probably did. Uh, <laughs> it's fantastic. Um, yeah. It so was, um, Big in Japan was the, 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 one of the first groups you were in, wasn't it? With, with Bill again and, and um, Holly Johnson and Jane Casey and stuff like that. What were you trying to do? That was kind of, kind of an art, art rock project in some ways, wasn't it? It was like a Death load School. of nonsense, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. I was just being kind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it was really great fun, you know, and it taught me an awful lot of stuff that I... I think I might have ended up being a bit of a muso, you know, because I was so obsessed by the music. And I went into the Illuminatus, I did this play, and I met these people, you know, Jane and Holly and all these people, and Pete Burns, actually, dead or alive, and all, all these other people just looked so much larger than life. And... I think I adopted, and you know, I just, 
it dawned on me that everything was about an idea, not just about notes, you know. And it was like, I suppose it was the punk ethic. So it was the idea of if something, if you have a great idea and you can't do it very well, it'll always still be a great idea. Whereas if you haven't got an idea and you do it really well, who, the f who cares, you know what I mean? It's, who cares? So it became all about an idea and stuff. And big in Japan, the idea was just to get on stage, basically. I mean, Bill was very much of the, of the thing. He always wanted to do a stunt or a scam. And he, his thing was, you know, people, you know, if you, make, if you say it's art, it'll be fine. And, you know, so we could all piss on a wall yeah. like, like the stones he always to. I think a mixture of Andrew Lou Goldham and Andy Warhol, really. Do you know what I mean? And somewhere between the two was Bill. And uh, so we did a few gigs, but we didn't have very many songs. And um, so we used to play the song. We had a song called Big in Japan, funnily enough. And we used to play that three times <laughs> at various tempos. And it still wasn't long enough, you know. So we decided we needed another song. So we came up with the idea and we had a song called Reading the Charts. And we would all feedback, we'd just get loads of feedback on our amps and Jane would take out the charts of that week and she'd read the charts, you know. <laughs> so, you know, and it was very much of that ilk, really. Yeah, it was yeah. just ideas and yeah. Velvet Underground-y, really, we wanted to be, I think. I wanted to mention Original Mirrors because I was listening to a Gary Kemp uh, podcast with you, actually, uh, about a month ago, and uh, he was going on about how he could feel that, that there was something very original about your sound that he thought you too might have borrowed from, and he, you know, that the, the, the Duran Duran had borrowed from. I don't know, did you see any, uh, if you can be that immodest, can you see any, any groups that, that took any I think of I think there was, we were slightly before... And we had everything except the songs that they had, do you know what yeah, I mean? Which yeah. are the important thing, and the charm. Um, but it's funny, when I was in Original Mirrors, I played uh, round the corner from here, funnily enough, in the Marquee Club. And uh, it was kind of like just a not very busy Thursday night. And, um, you know, there was this guy going mad in front of me in the audience, really very enthusiastic, you know. And I was looking for myself, I thought, is that Pete Townsend? <laughs> I thought, it is Pete Townsend, you know. And then after the gig, Pete came back, you know, and he, he loved all the stuff I was doing with the echoes and that. And whenever I see him, he always says to me, you know, that, that you two, they nicked that idea, didn't they? You know, they took that idea off you. But I think I just bought an echo chamber a week before, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't really, you know, you just press well, go. Well, let's just say they did. Yeah. yeah. You just press go on the echo yeah, and that was it, yeah. you know. Well, uh, when you started working with Echo and the Bunnymen, but only, only produced them, they asked you to produce them, and later on all sorts of other people were asking, I think Robert Plant and, uh, you know, I think Steve Lillywhite and stuff, and they, did, they desperately wanted you, and, uh, were very, and you were a friend of theirs, you know. But you only did it under a pseudonym. So why, why, why was that? Again, we have to start talking about Bill Drummond, to be fair. Oh, know? OK. So I was uh, at a bus stop, actually, in Smithdown Road in Liverpool, just... Uh, going home and it was raining and the bunny man had signed a record contract which was you know a pretty big deal then you know and um they drove past in with their record contract they'd bought an old van or les had bought a van or something so and they went past and they saw me at the bus stop and they stopped and they gave me a lift and uh, as we were going along we were all sort of sitting in the front and they had this cassette on and I was like, what's this? You know, it's quite good. And they were like, oh, we've just been to Rockfield. We've started, you know, we, this is our first attempt at making a record, you know, but we're not that happy with it. And me being me was like, I'm not surprised you're not happy with it. That bit's crap and you should have this <laughs> bit over there. And you, you know, you, you're doing that right, you know, which was just kind of how I was really, you know. And then I got out and I didn't think much about it. And about a week later, I got a phone call from Bill who was the manager of Echo and the Bunny. And, um, you know, and he said, listen, you know, Mac and Will were saying, you know, you had some really good ideas about the songs. Do you fancy producing, producing a couple of the songs for a single? 
And I was like, no, no, I don't want to do that. I don't, you know, I'm, an, I'm a songwriter, and that would be like poacher, gamekeeper, crossing a line. I, I've got no desire to be a producer, you know. I think it would make it difficult for me to be a songwriter. I don't know why I thought that. So he said, oh, okay, you know, and he got off. And then about three days later, he phoned me up and he said, what about if you had an alter ego that wasn't you? And it was like kind of bizarro Superman, you know. And your alter ego produced Echo and the Bunnymen, but then you would be free to be a songwriter. And I thought, yeah, that'll work. Yeah, that'll be good. Because <laughs> I was an idiot. And uh, so he said, well, you know, we have to think of, of a name. And I, I, had a, I had a good friend, actually, who was an artist called Chris, Chris Scarland, I think his name was. And, but he was very, um, had a lot of issues with schizophrenia and stuff like that. And not long before, you know, I went, I went to visit my mum and she'd said to me, uh, oh, you, you know, Chris came round uh, earlier on. And I was like, all oh, right. And she said, he was very, very upset. And he asked me to pass a message on to you. And he said that he's very worried about nuclear bombs. And he's managed to get his hands on two asbestos suits. And you need to give him a ring. But by the way, he said to tell you, you are King Bird. King Bird. So I that thought, well, that's the perfect alter ego for yeah. this kind of production. So I used the name King Bird. What, what have you, what have you, what's the most important thing you've learned about production? You've done about a lot production. Of it, so what, what's, the, what's the most vital thing that's the requirement? You know? That I don't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Why um, not? Uh, it's like uh, everyone else is at the party and you're, you know, worrying about something. You know, I, I don't know. I, I did. I, that's a bit unfair. That I loved. I mean, the reason I, I did a couple of tracks with the Bunny Men, and I adored Echo and the Bunny Men. You know, and they were my mates. But when there was the four of them on stage, it was the chemistry. It was something else, uh, bigger than the sum of the parts. And when Ian sang and the work, you know, it was just, you know, it was it was intimidating in a way. And although they asked, you know, there was a point where they asked me, did I want to join? And I felt like I didn't want to disrupt the chemistry between those people. So the closest thing I could do to being in the band after we'd done Rescue and the first couple of songs that we did would be producing them, you know. Yeah. So I think that's why I, you know, wanted to produce them because it was like I could be in the band for a couple of months. But there's also an element of production where, where if you produce a record that doesn't sell, it's probably just as much work for the producer as the one that does sell. And it must be heartbreaking when, when, when they don't take off. I think for me the issue was, um, you know, to, to get, you know, talking about music business and stuff like that, I didn't like the idea that you're hired by the record company, but my loyalty is to the music, to the band. But even then when the songs become real, my loyalty becomes to the song as more than yeah. the band. So I felt like, even to this day, I very rarely produce anything, but I love the idea of collaborating. If someone said to me, do you fancy collaborating with our band? I'd say, yeah, if I like the band. But if they asked me to produce it, I'd say no. Do you know, and, it, and there yeah. is a difference in that. And although that, I think in the hip hop world now, that division is, you know, you just, everyone's just writing it and, making a record and putting things in. But the idea of being a producer, although I, I, I was, I think I was good at it, but for me, the job of the producer was to sort of identify what the band sounded like. Yeah. Because they very rarely sound like they think they sound. So it was like to figure out what they thought they sounded like. And then to kind of, be whatever was deficient to them getting yeah. to that goal and sometimes it would just be you know turning a few things up and down sometimes it yeah. would be about you know arranging the songs or writing a bit into the song whatever it took for them to get to that place what they already thought they sounded like yeah. that's what I kind of saw it as there's a great moment with, with Pure when that comes out which uh, again extraordinary moment Dick Leahy guy from the old 60s music industry 
believes in the, you as a songwriter, and I think they pressed up 500 copies. And suddenly there's this moment where you heard it played on the Steve Wright show. Which is a, re a real life-changing moment, isn't it? Isn't it? Describe what happened there. Well, pure... I, ha I have... Uh, there's a romantic notion with me, you know, and whenever you hear about a song, you know, if I say to you, I've got a new song, it's the best song I've ever written, y you know, it, it has a mystery and it has a power that a finished song doesn't have. As soon as you finish a song, it becomes something, but it loses 90% of the power of what it could have been. The dream that you had for it, the unreal dream, the aspiration you had to it, that you were hoping it could be this or that or the other, but it is only one thing, so it loses all this other stuff. And there is a certain power to the unheard album or the un the, you know, the one Nick Drake heard wrote that we never heard oh it's got to be the best one you know and there is a power in that and Pure in a way was a miracle for me it changed my life you know I, I was becoming a producer and I didn't want to be and I kind of made a stand by stopping but I didn't know what to do I didn't have a band I didn't have a singer I didn't have anything you know and I, um, so I kind of, I suppose, you know, I, I just tried to write a few songs. And I wrote three or four songs. And when it came to Pure, when I came to do the vocal, I realised that other people's vocals were like, you know, a verse, a couple of lines yeah. repeated. And, other, and this was like tons and tons of words. And I sang it, but I thought, oh, I've done this wrong, you know, this, this is... This is unprofessional, it's not, you know, I, I, you know, so I said to the engineer, this one hasn't worked out, forget it, you know. And he said, oh, you know, I really like it, you know. But it took off so rapidly, so fast. It didn't you're... really, actually, to be honest, you know, <laughs> no, not at all. So what happened was, I didn't ever finish it, but it went on the tape. So I never mixed it, I never cut the beginning off, which is all the bab bubs. Mm. I never top and tailed it. And Dick just really liked it and said, right. let's press up a few and put it out. So he pressed them up and it went on for months and they just gradually sell out. And I mean, there was no record company really. So it was this song that wasn't finished, yeah. wasn't, didn't have a record deal, didn't have a record company, just got a few pressed up for rough trade. And it just kept another hundred and then it had someone in Stowe could play it on, you know. And it went on, really went on for months, and then I got this news, and John Peel played it a couple of times, God bless him. And, um, and then I got this news that Steve Wright, which was the biggest show on Radio One, and he was gonna play the record, and it was gonna be on Wednesday at this time, you know, and this was like big, big news, you know. So, I, you know, I was at home and, you know, with, um, you know, we were sitting around the radio and, you know, wait for it. And then Steve Wright came on and, it, you know, it was, it was like, wow, I've made it. You know, I'm on, the, I'm on the radio to 12 million people or wherever it was that time. And it got to halfway through and it stopped and he took it off, you know. And I was like, oh, my God. It's, I knew it wasn't up to the standard. There was too many words and... It's not a professional, you know, it's, he's taking it off, you know. And I was, it went from that to that, you know, I was devastated. And then he said, uh, who is this? Who has made this record? Lightning Seeds, pure, I've never, this is fantastic. I'm gonna play it again from the beginning. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. I was like, wow, that never happened, uh, you know. extraordinary. And he played it again, and then he went, I'm gonna play it again. And he played it again. And it was like... Uh, it transformed <laughs> it, didn't it? Sorry. It really transformed it. it? it then yeah. all of a sudden it went on the playlist yeah. and loads of other people. And it just was a moment that tipped everything. And all of a sudden I was a recording artist. And it's so interesting in the book because you're, you know, you're a, you know, to some extent a kind of shy and retiring person. You know, and, and you're not a natural front man. And suddenly you, you've got to be in a band, you've got to perform. And you talk very honestly about what it's like going on kids TV and, and, and uh, you want presented Top of the Pops in fact. I you know? did. So what, what was that like? I mean, it's an enormous Extremely uh, uncomfortable. 
Who did the you have to thing. introduce? Can you remember? I can because I had to introduce the Spice Girls actually, and they had this amazing dance routine that they put a lot of effort into it, and I had to. They were behind me, and I had to basically say about ten words coherently, and it would then go into them. And I kept getting it wrong, and they kept doing this dance routine, and and then they were like, "We're shattered here, you know. Get, you know, try and say it right, because it's killing us here. We have to start because they kept having to start again, you know. So, it was, and the pressure was even more. But eventually, I managed to say ten words correctly, and they carried on, you know. Uh, but it was it was quite good fun. But it, I think I did have imposter syndrome. You know, I just felt like I was looking for someone to be the singer in the band right up to the third album, to Jollification. And then on Jollification, the penny finally dropped that, you know, if you're going to write words like this, you have to sing them because they're too personal for someone else to sing. Um, and then I was quite uncomfortable. I, I started playing live, but it took a long time for me to feel... You know, to not just be racing towards the end of the gig, really. Yeah. Well, we're skipping slightly, but I've got to ask you, obviously, about the um, about Three Lions, because it, there's a really long section of the book describing how it came up about. And you'd, I think, written a track, possibly with Bill Drummond, I think, called Match of the Day, which was on a compilation album, wasn't it? And that was being used in some context, I think, in, in football broadcasting. And so you got a call, didn't you, from the FA about whether you'd be interested in writing the, the, the new anthem for the, for the Euros. So what happened then? Well, it, what happened was the first song that we ever got, there was a, a, an album called Street to Street that was unsigned bands who were kind of unemployed, who could use this studio, and they put out a compilation. And I'd written this instrumental, um, and I, I just needed a title, and I said, oh, match of the day. And it was kind of prophetic, and then years on, after Pure, with the second album, Sense, I wrote a song. I was waiting for my son to be born, actually, who's called Riley. And I wrote half the song. He was a bit late. And I wrote half the song, hoping he'd be all right when he was born. And then I finished it off after he was born. Uh, but for some... So it was nothing to do with football. But it got adopted by Match of the Day. And then Match of the Day used to use it on their rundown of the best goals for quite a long time. And it became a connection to football <coughs> through a really weird route that was... But initially you weren't that excited, were you? Because you, you weren't terribly approving of the England team. You thought it was sort of slightly racist following. And so, so you there was a first lot of overtones that were a bit yeah. weird. And the idea of writing... Um, you know, I, I, you know I, I obviously New Order had done for, uh, one for... And it was quite funny and I liked it, but I still felt it ingle and I didn't really want to get involved with that and uh, and then the pennants started going up and there was a couple of things in Liverpool and I saw you know Russia was playing Czech Republic and, and I thought god you know it's, it's since 1966 there's never been a competition it is very exciting and I happened to be watching fantasy football and I just felt the two of them were very in tune with it you know it wasn't really about the players it was about just footy fans, the whole... It was new, the idea of fantasy Brilliant football. Brilliant piece of casting. You know. It's fantastic. And I just thought, if these guys fancied doing it... So they came up, and we had a, a, a chat about it. And, um, and we both... Obviously, I'm a Liverpool fan. And the song that Liverpool sing is not about the team, and it's not about football. It's from Carousel. It's You'll Never Walk Alone. And it's a song about community and about people being together and hoping against adversity. And I very much, if we were going to do the song, we all had the idea that we didn't really want the squad singing on it and we didn't want it to be triumphant or jingoistic. We wanted it to kind of be the opposite of that. And it would be about what it felt like to lose, essentially, <laughs> when you're not very good. But their first, the initial reaction of the FA wasn't very positive because they wanted you to change certain lines. Surprisingly, lines? they weren't that into a song that said, we're going to lose everything, yeah. Um, so, yeah, they came back to me and said, right, you know, take these two fellas off it, whoever they are. And, um, yeah, take these guys off it. We want you to call it the beautiful game. Rewrite the words and, you know, and it became a bit of an issue. And I said, you know, I'll How did pass. you convince them to keep Skinner and Badil? basically said, I'll pass on that. 
And then I think Sony, who I was signed to, my good friend Rob, said to the FA, we'll put it out unofficially, we love it, so you can either be part of it or not. And I think then they just went, oh, okay then. But they've, they've never really liked it. And they, you know, they much prefer Neil Diamond. <laughs> As do I. What, but I can't think what happened. Now. I think the mirror or somebody printed some of the lyrics on the front page, and suddenly it just became huge, didn't it? I mean, how, and, and there were international versions. Didn't it get in the German charts? From what I imagine. Oh yeah, it was number one. And and there's a lot of sporting people throughout the world, which that's what I love really. I think it's about being. A fan, really, and it because obviously but various been, companies, uh, countries came to you and said, "Can we yeah, change it, rewrite yeah, it for yeah. whoever it was, Sweden or something?" Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and Bayern Munich changed the words and did it as one of their records, and various people uh, in South America. But it's kind of cool because it's it's um, you know it became something a little bit more than it was kind of what you hoped it might be, really, you know. What would, it, what would it feel like to, to be in a stadium? I can't imagine how exciting it must be to hear, you know, one of your songs being sung by 80,000 people or turn on the television and watch matches abroad where people sing one of your songs. How does that feel? I think, you know, I've had a complicated relationship with that song, you know, because it took me to a place that I possibly wasn't at my most comfortable. And it... Obviously, I am the guy who wrote that song. I'm not the guy who wrote Pure. I'm not the guy who wrote... Look, I'm the guy who wrote that song. And I, I'm very grateful for that. And, I, and it's given me an awful lot. And now I'm very comfortable with it. And I loved hearing its song in stadiums. It was thrilling. It was great. The whole competition was great. And, of course, although it's been criticised for... You know, they've said, oh, you know, it's arrogant to say it's coming home. It was written about the competition being held in England, not about winning anything. It was just the competition is coming, football is coming home and there's a competition here where it started. So it really wasn't triumphalism in any way. But, um, but obviously with music, people take what they want from it. But then it was even, I think the fact that it's kept coming back and in 2020 when it was number one again and all the memes and people who weren't born in 1996 were discovered it that was that was when i really got comfy with it you know and it just became everyone else's song and something else do you know what i mean that i was very comfortable with so i finally kind of came to terms with that and was able to to play it live comfortably and just enjoy it without but the initial reaction when you 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 talk about it in some detail in the book when you start after it becomes a hit, and you go out and you're suddenly playing much bigger venues, but the people who are turning up are often dads and sons, and that's the song they want to hear, and they're not terribly interested in hearing anything by the lightning seeds, and there are occasions where you don't, in fact, even play it, and then people get very upset. Yeah, I mean, that's a very unflattering way of saying it, actually. I think they were the same size <laughs> venues, <laughs> if you don't mind. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to re-edit that. Uh, no, they were the same. I mean, to be honest with you, Jollification, which was pre Three Lions, sold twice as much as Dizzy Heights, which was post. So it actually affected us in a negative way. But um, because I think it put us centre stage and we weren't like an indie band anymore all of a sudden. Or we kind of were, but we weren't. Um, but what happened was like, so we, the album that came afterwards. Um, I thought, well, you know, that was a football record and the two comedians are singing it. That's probably separate. So we probably shouldn't play live. I noticed New Order didn't play um, their one, you know, and I thought, you know, we, you know, we probably... I'd rather not play it. Let's just get back to business as usual, you know. Uh, and the first gig on the tour was Preston, actually. It was a big theatre in Preston. And, you know, so we didn't rehearse the song... And we went on stage and the lights came up and I looked out and the first four rows were all dads and sons all in England shirts, you know, all. <laughs> and it was like, well, and the gig was good. They did like the other songs, you know, they didn't go the bar or anything. Uh, but obviously they were expecting the sort of triumphant end of the show to be Three Lions. And we hadn't rehearsed it, so it was, it was very uncomfortable. And kids were crying, you know, and... and, and <laughs> And I, people were very, very angry with me. 
after the show as I was leaving and still to this day remark on it. Oh, well, that guy, bloody, you know, I took my son. And it was like, whoa, you know, I, I, I don't know what to do here. Are we, are we, can we play it, you know, without them singing it or can I, you know, and it was, it was very, so, it, you know, and do I want it to overshadow everything? So it just became always a, and obviously in other countries, you don't want to play it in Glasgow, you know, you get killed. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it, it's very, you know, it just became almost an issue. I had to think about, so we rehearsed it, obviously, and we played it wherever we felt it was appropriate. Um, but then later in 2020, I think after that it became, we do our songs, and at the end, it's a celebration, the deal. and it's yeah. a sing-along, and it's, we could be playing, you know, Dirty Old Town or something. Yeah, it's yeah, something yeah. for everyone to sing and enjoy, except in Scotland. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's kind of, it's, it's taken a place now where, where it's okay and we can coexist. And you could be doing, the, you redid a version of it last year for the, for the Women's uh, World Cup, you know, yeah, fantastic yeah. version. And uh, that could be carrying on. But it did strike me that, that, uh, that the England team are, are very, very much fancied for the Euros next year. Now, if they were to win, would that in a way ruin the, 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 the value of the song? The song is, is, is about them not winning. And it's about, it's about failure, and it's about wanting them to succeed, but knowing yeah. that they won't. But if they won, would that, would that change things? Well, it was written about the competition coming here and coming yeah. home. And my, I don't know, I mean, obviously I can't answer that, but in my experience, as soon as you've won one and you're in the next one, you kind of want to win that one. Do you know what I mean? So it, it, that's the thing about being a football fan. It's, it's the journey, I think, or about anything, really. It's the journey and the hopes. They're the best bit, really, do you know what I mean? And, and it's nice if you win, but only one team wins every year and we all just carry on believing, do you know what I mean? Because I think it's, that's the fun of it, really. And, and um, you know, so I, I've got a feeling that that is what's encapsulated in that song and I think that feeling will carry on. It's a fantastic book. And are there any? I have to say as well, I wouldn't count me chickens on them winning it either. Oh no, no, that's true. That's that's very fair. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> we've been through this so many that's times. I know. I know. Just when you think they are, I that's know. when they get you. Yeah. But the, uh, but the it's, a, it's a brilliant book. Is, are, are, is there a moment, a particularly fond moment in, it, in the, the whole thing, the, through, through, through the, the entire? career as it were was there, was there a golden moment do you think I don't I, I, I see it as a series of I, I've been I think I've been very fortunate in the people I've encountered and and just had a lot of luck and kind of just there's never been a plan mm. and I've I, you know so I, I kind of just see it as a, like a load of bubbles floating about really you know and I, I sort of I think we covered it because I think the moment that changed my life and that was a miracle is pure, you know, that is, I don't know what happened there, it's just, I've never written a song as good as that again, and I love playing it, and I always play it at every gig, and I kind of just, that's the moment for me where, if it hadn't been for that, nothing else happens, you know. Well, it's so beautifully described in the book, I mean, it's really extraordinary, it's a fantastic book, and, uh, we have copies of it here. If anyone would like to buy one, Ian is very happy to sign it. And uh, really nice to talk to you. Thanks Lovely all to for speak coming. To you. Thank you for having me. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. Mm-hmm.